get out of here, knock it out of the park, right? That, that's the focal point. Because as you can see, what we're going into today, we're talking about machine learning. Specifically though, right, if you remember from Monday, what we were talking about was this idea that there's sort of two kind of categories of machine learning. We've got what we're gonna focus in on to start, right? This idea of supervised learning. Uh, and then there's unsupervised learning. Well, again, the idea is that a lot of times, if we have a data set, we can utilize that. We can make decisions from it, from those observations. So when we're thinking about the idea of the decision tree, it's mostly focused in this supervised learning perspective and specifically Yeah, I can spell, I swear, right? Classification, that's our task, right? So what we're getting at here is why? Well, what, what, what this decision tree, you know, what the thing about, so one of the things that what you'll see out there in the world with AI these days is a big, you know, $5 term called explainable AI. You may have seen, who, anyone seen that term? Is that a term? Okay, I say all, one nod, two, right? Explainable AI. The reason why is because, right, this is an entity. It's a machine. It's a model that is making a decision. People get freaked out when things that, you know, they don't understand start making decisions, right? So this is the reason why we focus at least on the decision tree is it is actually one of the most straightforward. You could hand this to your parents if they are not computer scientists or machine you know, statisticians, right? You can hand them a decision tree, visual, and it makes intuitive sense, right? Look at this. Oh, if I looked at the pedal width and if I knew, you know, if this was in inches or centimeters, right? If it was less than 0.6 centimeters, okay, it's the setosa. Oh, well, if it's bigger than that, then I gotta start evaluating the other attributes that were in the data set. And so again, as you can start to see, what this is, is it's, again, very straightforward, very much explains, you know, the decision-making process that the agent, the algorithm was using. But this is where we start getting into this term. Oh, this is a fun term, right? Essentially, it's chaos. It is confusion. It is uncertainty. We, when we think about this from a computer science perspective, from an algorithmic perspective, we are trying to reduce incorrect guesses, right? We want to be able to make a guess, but we want to be able to reduce the chance that the algorithm is wrong. And so, Essentially, when we're starting to think about the di this whole decision tree process, right? When I ask a question, I'm essentially, you know, trimming out all of my possibilities. I'm reducing the amount of confusion that my guess may eventually have. So again, as we start to look at this, the structure, it's a tree-like structure, right? Tree, but that means we have terminology that we've borrowed from our data structure World, world, class. <laughs> Jennifer's calling. Hello? Hello. Are you a robot? Yes. What can I do for you? Um, I am a student or a graduate student in the needs department and Okay, this is a classroom, I so I'm not Nope, I am a teacher giving a class right now. Say hi class. Hi. Hi class. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer, I gotta go. <laughs> But <laughs> at least it wasn't a robot. 
right? Or that was a really good scam, right? Either way, back to this. Come on. All righty. So what we're dealing with in 360. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, oh, so much tension in the room. And that just, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate you so much. My point being, all right, so what we're dealing with here is, okay, we've got internal nodes. And the entire idea is the internal, ugh, the internal node is meant to be our, what's the attribute we are splitting from at this given moment? Because our leaf nodes, if you notice, every single one of those leaf nodes, no more paths, Oh, they're a designation. They're a guess. And I actually want to point specifically at these Virginica and uh, Verisicolor ones here because you notice, right, there's numbers on the other side of this, right? Some of them didn't have that, or that one did. That one didn't. That one didn't. That one does. That one, right? I keep saying this idea of a guess, right? It is a filtering process to try and get us to that confidence threshold that, hey, you know, I only got four left, but the majority of them in this kind of leftover filtering process are varicose colors. So, right, even though it's not perfect, right, you can see, hey, maybe you know, throw, you know, throwing a dart at the wall kind of thing. Uh, and so our edges, again, are just the, how we evaluate those attributes. So again, if you remember, as we were talking on Monday, when we deal with this classification task, the idea is I have my observations. And the goal is now, hey, given that these are my observations, can I establish what the value of y would be, right? All I'm effectively doing is I'm taking in these parameters. Notice this is eerily similar to some of the work that we saw with um, linear programming, right? The only real difference is we start getting a little funkier with that line in essence. But I'm just passing in those parameters to some function, right? Function does what it does, and it spits out a value. So now I ask... Again, if it's super intuitive and it makes perfect sense that anyone could do it, that means you can do it, right? Sepal length, sepal width, pedal length, pedal width. What's my class? Irisitosa. Irisitosa, because again, if we look, all right, well, our root is pedal width. Hey, is pedal width less than 0 0.6? Absolutely. Satosa. Now you get to be on timeout. Good job, you got the easy one. Next category. I'm feeling like uh, someone on this side. Yes. Iris Versicolor. Uh, Versicolor, I don't know how to pronounce it either. I really should learn because I use this all the time. My point being, all right, pedal width, we check. Okay, it's very clearly larger than 0 0.6. We then look at pedal width again, but it is smaller than 1.7. So then we look at pedal length. Is that smaller? It is. And look at that. Shot in the dark. There's a color. So again, you see that, again, what the decision tree is effectively doing is it's building out the tree that you are playing pachinko or uh, planko or whatever your, your dropping coin bouncing uh, game of choice would be. So what I'm going to do at least today is I'm going to teach you the ID3, that word, algorithm. It is not the only algorithm. It is the discrete version of the decision tree. The reason why I, I kind of picked this one is, again, I only get a certain amount of time, and I really want to make sure that you understand the core understanding of what's going on in the background. But I don't want to get lost in the weeds dealing with floating point values, right? Because that breaks a lot of stuff. And in fact, we use a completely different algorithm for that. Right? There's a link. You can. Uh, go through and work with it. But again, ID3, it allows for me to sort of help convey, hey, here's what's going on, right? I showed you one, but how do I build that tree? 
right? That's the important part. So that's what we're going to at least focus in on today. It's not that it's good or bad. It's decision tree for discrete attributes. Is that a question? Does the decision tree have to be a binary tree? No. And the reason why is because we'll actually see it later on. So the answer is no. Uh, and I'll show you in a little bit. So what's the entire process? Here's your algorithm. Again, so it's effectively a little bit of recursion. Remember, we're dealing with supervised data. We're dealing with something that has some A1, A2, A3, A4 label. It has some number of attributes going on. But specifically, I want you to just realize what kind of data type is that? Starts with an A. It's an array, right? It's a multi-dimensional array. And so, well, I can process this. I could trim this. I could divide and conquer. I could do all of those things that you learned in the data structures course. But specifically, if I hand it over to this algorithm, you notice we're calling them samples. Right? That giant array has a bunch of labels attached to it. Can I traverse all of those samples and ask a simple question? Are they all equal? Yeah, I can. And if they are, congratulations, you're at a leaf node. You can go ahead and say, well, what was this thing that they were all the same value of? Because again, all of our samples at this point are setosas, varicicolors, virginicas. But what if they're not? What if some are setosas, some are varicicolors, some are virginicas? What do I do then? Well, again, this is where we'll talk about this in a little bit, but we try and determine, all right, well, since these are not the same, let me pick a different color. I have four values to pick from. Which one do I use to be my split? Which one do I use to be that dividing factor in my values, right? And when I do that, then notice, essentially, that's what I'm doing next is build your samples. Take your multidimensional array, split it into however many multidimensional arrays you want, right? And based on that criteria that you establish, here's your inner nodes for them. And you notice what we're eventually then going to do is we're just going to add more recursive calls on that subset that we work from. And then we continue to build until we eventually, right, hit a time that we're done. So again, as we're looking through this, where are you? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> now we get to bring in that uncertainty again, that chaos, right? Again, think about it. It's a machine. It's trying to make a guess based on its observations. So the problem with that is, is if I were to randomly select one, what is the probability? Not really probability, but what is the chaos or uncertainty of actually getting a specific value, or getting the value I wanted? That's actually the, the best way to pick it. Uh, do I have my, I don't have, all right, well, this is my coin, okay? Heads, tails, all right? Now, we understand probability, right? What's the probability of landing on heads? 50-50, right? I have a probability of landing on heads 50%. Now, how likely am I to get it right if I were to call it in the air? Hmm? Well, that's where not quite. That's what entropy is starting to get at, is this idea of how sure am I when I make my guess? Heads. Yeah. yeah. Uh. My point being is like, again, when I make that guess, that's the problem. Because if 
I have, un, I have uncertainty, right? That's me flipping the coin. If I have that uncertainty, I may get it wrong. I want to try and reduce that, right? The higher this number becomes, the less confident I am in the call. Flipping a coin, okay, yeah, fine, we get it. But like, again, think about it from dice roll or, uh, again, trying to predict flowers, right? The entire idea is I don't want that guess to be uncertain. I want to try and define it as best I can. So this is the formula for entropy. Now, specifically, I will uh, stress this. When we talk about entropy, we are talking about entropy from the computer science perspective, not the physics perspective. Those are two different things. Right? They're similar, but not at the same time. Right? The, but the entire idea is, all right, well, the uncertainty right, that a, a guess would have is the summation of the probability of that guess happening times the log base 2 of that probability. What? Huh? You also see it like this. I, I, you know, when I said probability, you notice I, I, I sort of kind of didn't mention the subtraction going on there. But again, here's where we start to think about it. Again, let me pull out my giant coin again. Here's my giant coin. We said it had a 50-50 chance of happening. Now, what if it didn't? I'm sorry, uh, if we are thinking about it from the 50-50 perspective, right? Okay, well, I have. What's the probability of getting heads? What's the probability of getting tails? Now, specifically, I'm going to make a double-sided coin. Hada. It's heads on both sides, right? Because it's red on both sides. My point being is now I have a double-sided coin. I will always land on red uh, heads, right? So I flip it, call it in the air, heads, right? OK, what is the uncertainty now of me landing on heads or on me landing on tails? How certain are you that you can know the answer now of this flip? 100%, right? You know it's still heads, right? That's essentially what I'm presenting here. If the probability of heads is one, if the probability of landing on heads is one, what does the calculation look like? Well, essentially, right, again, if we're thinking about that, the probability of landing on one value, again, we said was one. I'm going to put my thing away, right? Okay, what's well, one? Probability, or probability times log base two of one. And this is why I pulled up, or I, you saw me having Python open as well, just so I can do quick math, right? If I'm looking at that, m dot log one base two, look at that calculation. It's a zero. So all I'm seeing is negative one times zero minus zero. Right? And th this is where it gets annoying, right? Because technically speaking, what should happen here? You can't do that math. That's an undefined. But whatever that undefined is, multiply it by zero, doesn't care. We're canceling it out anyway. So, but you notice, again, log base two of one minus just a zeroed out thing. What was the uncertainty? There's no uncertainty. It's 100% certain. Now what about a real coin? Again, my real coin, heads, tails. I have a coin flip. How likely are you to guess the correct number? Well, now it's 50-50. And so you notice suddenly, oh, well, probabilities are changing. Those logs are changing, and both of them are changing, right? Heads, tails. When I do 0 0.5, I get a value, negative 1. Oh, okay. Now notice what the math would start to look like. Negative 0 0.5 times negative 1. So that times negative 0 0.5 equals a positive one point, yeah, positive 
0.5. That's going to be the exact same. This is where what you would end up seeing if you were to plug out the entire thing is positive. Yes, it is being subtracted, but that gets all funkied and, you know, you're doing that same calculation again. That would become a positive. And so 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. So what I'm getting at is now we have maximum uncertainty. You can't guess this correctly, or you are uncertain. You are the maximum uncertain with your guess of a 50-50. Am I following so far? Good, good, yes. I can put this away. Good. Uh -huh. Now, specifically, though, this is where, you know, it's a lot of extra clarification. The max, the max entropy of two classes, heads, tails, is 1.0. But that's not always the case. What happens if I have three values of three equal uh, uh, probabilities? Or I have four values of four equal probabilities, right? That gets plugged in. That same math is going into our case. Now, again, what's the probability? Well, the probability of getting, I don't know, I'm rolling a D4 or something, rolling, landing a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4, whatever my purpose. Point is, as I start to plug in the values, what you're going to notice is I'm not getting back 1. In fact, I'm getting back 2 this time. So why I kind of mentioned this, and this is why, like I said earlier, that when we refer to entropy in machine learning, we're referring to it as um, a computer science version of entropy, not a physics version of entropy, is specifically the best description to this actually comes from the author, right? The reason why, the, I can't remember his name, but the reason why he selected it is effectively he needed a term to try and represent Specifically, how many bits does my guess need like to represent all my possible answers? How many bits would I be needing to work off of? So the reason why 2 has a max entropy of 1 is because right, 2 to the power of that 1, that max entropy, tells me my values. Oh, the 4 classes, well, the max entropy is 2 because the power of or 2 to the power of that would be four, right? If, just to really kind of hammer it home, right, if I were to take uh, 0 0.33 times uh, m dot log 0 0.33 base two minus 0 0.33 times math dot log 0 0.33 base two, or 0 0.33, times math.log, 0.33 base 2, right? So again, if we're thinking about what I'm about to do, right, I have three options, equal weight, but the entropy is not going to be 1. It's not going to be 2. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Ooh. Now, is it a perfect 0 1.5? You know, I probably need to be adding some trailing you know, things there, there, right? That's not really what I was trying to get at. But you notice, right, again, it's, it's our way of trying to represent how many bits we need to work off of based on our classes. So that's where your term or that value is coming from. And specifically, I, I always wanted to kind of point this out because I... You know, again, I don't want you thinking, oh, 100% entropy mean, or like 1 equals 100% uncertainty. That's not necessarily the case, right? It is all about what value you're getting and how close it is in relation to its maximum entropy. So now I present you with a nice little activity. What's the entropy of maybe a, a recommendation engine where seven of them say yes, and three of them say no. Now, I think this is the activity for y'all on Moodle. I got to double check. Mm -hmm. This is mostly just to see if I, I take my break now or not. Let's see. That is not yet, no. So we will we'll do this one.
by hand. So you're going to work with me. There we are. You're going to work with me. All right. So what do I write? We'll do first, let's say this is yes. Negative, huh? Not 0. 0.5, 0. 0.7, right? Because I got, if you're thinking about it from just like a, remember, what's the probability if I randomly selected one, it was yes, right? There's seven of them out of 10 times log base 2 of that 0 0.7. Now we get into the fun part. All right, well, if that was the 0 0.7s, what am I putting next? Okay. 0 0.3, right? Okay, all right, and this is, again, this is where you notice you are having to like be familiar with your calculator at this point because yes, as we go in, right? Okay, we're gonna plug that in. I'm gonna, that becomes a three. That becomes a three. It becomes a seven and that becomes a seven. And our entropy for randomly, you know, again, you guessing correctly on a random selection is 0 0.8812, right? Oh, and this is no. 0 0.88. Questions on entropy? So this is the answer to what's the entropy of the given? Yes. Uh, so in this case, light is the attribute. So very similar to like, um, so oh, yeah. when we do a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so a label is still technically an attribute in our, our view, you know, we're just, we also consider it the label or the class. In this case, you know, maybe I'm trying to predict if someone liked a thing, right? So the attribute. So again, as we work through that, as you can see, we plug it away. Now, that's all nice and great, but again, look at what I showed you at the beginning, right? I said, hey, it's not just one, right? It's multiple attributes. And so now, okay, I have my label. I have the thing I want to determine. I have that, that classification, but the problem is I need to start dealing with my observations. Specifically, do, ugh, do, No. Do I say do or does? Does a particular attribute reduce the uncertainty? That's the best way to think about this, right? Conditional entropy. Hey, if I were to know the genre, right? But just again, shot in the dark, again, we're still working on the yes and no's and all that stuff. It has an entropy of an 88, right? If I were to know genre, does that reduce my entropy? And by how much, right? How much knowledge am I effectively gaining? Because that's how I figure out my best attribute. So in this case, we start going, okay, well, what if I know the genre? What if I know the genre is a comedy? Just very zero in on that. I know that the, the, the movie that we're gonna be selecting is a comedy. How likely am I to guess the correct label now just based on the fact that I know that movie, it's a movie, would be a comedy, right? So again, what we're talking about with this conditional entropy, it follows the same format. Notice nothing really changed. I just am now on a smaller subset. I'm still working through that, hey, what's the probability of the thing happening, right? Then multiplying that by the log base two of it, and the thing not happening, or the, op the other options. So in this case, right, I still have, I have three comedy labels, I have two yeses, and one no. 
So again, we're left with that simple question. Well, I have one-third and two-thirds based on my options. So now what is the entropy or the conditional entropy based on this? Oh, now you notice it's a bigger number, right? Because we haven't done any interactions with this yet. We will get there. That's later, right? But just on sheer confusion or uncertainty alone, again, the only thing I know, right? I don't know any of these things. I'm getting rid of them so that they don't cloud your mind. Right? Action doesn't exist. Romance is dead. There's only comedy. <laughs> right? Again, so now pick one. How likely are you to guess the one that I picked? Right? You have a two thirds chance of at least getting the right label for it. And so we can actually do that for every single one of these, right? Not only do I do it for comedy, but then I do do it for action. Well, if we look at action, Whoever this daring, good-looking man is, assuming he's a man, right, clearly likes action movies. OK, fine. You notice the conditional entropy then. Oh, if you were to tell me that this movie was an action, OK, well, they're going to like that one. What about romance? I told you romance is dead. The toss-up depends on the movie, right? Is it from Hallmark or is it from Netflix? Depends. My point being, as you can see, so I suddenly have my different uncertainties for whether or not I like a movie based on genre. Good, yeah. Now again, that was only, again, I've isolated it. I'm only focusing in on those small little subsets. I still haven't really addressed that entropy in relation to these entropies. So what do I do? This is where the next step of the equation comes in. I was showing you sort of the micro steps of conditional entropy, where you do an evaluation on all your different values. What you end up doing is, again, now I'm asking that same kind of question. If I'm looking at entropy or conditional entropy, what is my label? Right? What is the entropy of my label? What's the uncertainty of my guess if all I know is the value of the attribute rather than the actual values? So suddenly, right, it stops being about genre romance, genre action, genre comedy. It becomes, I only care about it now of, What's the uncertainty of it being a, oh, sorry, a genre, knowing the genre? Doesn't matter what type, but just knowing the genre, how well can I make a guess? Well, again, what am I doing? Well, I'm taking all those calculations that I just did. I'm taking the conditional entropy of knowing the romances, the actions, the comedy the comedies, and I'm now multiplying them by the probabilities of those. Hey, just what's the probability that, again, shot in the dark, you were going to guess a, a romance genre, right? Doesn't matter. And you'll notice, again, okay, well, if we look at that, we've got three comedies, we've got three actions, and we've got four uh, of our romances. Okay, well, we take those probabilities, multiply them by those conditional entropies that we calculated out, summing them up, and we're left, finally, with another number. The conditional entropy, the amount of uncertainty that we get by learning the genre is 0 0.676. <sighs> Everyone follow me good so far? Good. Bueller. Bueller, Bueller. Okay, I know it's a lot of math and entropy is a big word. Okay. So now what? I have numbers. I have this number. I have, and I'll, I'll just you know, plug this one in, right? I have the entropy of light given genre, and that was 0 0.676, right? 
So now what do I do? Now we add in one more calculation. I have the entropy of just being able to guess if something is liked or not. I have the entropy of being able to guess if something is liked or not if I were to secretly, secretly, if I were to know the genre. And so now, essentially, since I have these two uncertainties, notice the difference between them. The last calculation that we have is something known as information gain. In essence, how much of a difference is made between the conditional entropy and the normal entropy of my guess. And you'll notice, right, that's what we're, we're getting at. We have the, the entropy, right, this is the entropy of a movie being liked. This is the entropy of a movie being liked based on if we know the genre. All right, well, then it's just a simple math game. I take that 0 0.8, 0 0.88 minus that 0 0.676, and I get another number. Right? I get the information gain. <laughs> I get a information gain of liked based on genre is going to equal, what was that, a zero? I wish I was a little bit taller. Anyone? Thank you, thank you. If you don't get that, you need to listen to more 90s hip hop. My point being, again, what's going on is, again, what's the uncertainty of our value? Then if we know some value of it, uh, and the difference is what we call information gain. Now what? What do you think? Compare the attributes. We compare the attributes, because I only did it with one. That means I got to do it again, and again, and again. Right? I got to do it with every single one of my attributes because, okay, so this is me just doing the calculation. It's slightly off, whatever. That's not, you know, my point. My point is, right, my game for decision trees is now I do all of those calculations for every single one of the attributes inside of the current sample set, right? Because, again, think about what we're looking for. We're looking for best criteria. What's going to be the best thing to split our data across so that we can reduce the entropy, right? <clears throat> so give me one second. Just look at my movie list now. Ah. So again, you notice, oh, I have a bunch of different movies going on here. They have a bunch of different genres. They have some links to them because, you know, we're a TikTok generation these days. We can't have anything going over 90 minutes, right? Extended Lord of the Rings, nah, my watch. I take a nap in there, right? My point being is, okay, well, again, I have criteria. I have attributes about my movies that I can use to make sort of guesses, right? So I have the genre. I have the length of the movie. I have who the director is, and I may have that liked attribute that we you know, chase for recommendations. And so again, the question becomes, which one of my attributes would be the best one to serve as essentially the root node, the first split, right? I have already calculated out genre, but guess what? That means I have to do the whole thing again with length or with director, technically both of them, right? I have to go through each one. And so again, this is hand waving the math so that I don't have to do it all or you know, bust it out, right? So what's the probability that I have a short movie, right? I have five short films, I have uh, three mediums, and I have two longs, right? So probability of a short, five out of 10, three out of 10, two out of 10, 
right? Times whatever their respective uh, conditional entropies are for those little tiny pieces. Again, if we're thinking about it from just what's the conditional entropy of knowing the length was long. Knowing that the length is long, does this handsome devil of a user like this movie? No. No, it doesn't matter. I don't even need to know anything else. I just, I know that uh, a long movie, uh-uh, nah, right? What about mediums? Okay, well, we look at the mediums. Again, do I know if they like medium movies? Yes, every instance or every observation I see is they liked it. Then it's just what's the conditional entropy of short movies? Well, again, there's a mix there. And so there's a little calculation. It's one-fifth over against four-fifths. But you notice that's all those calculations are. So short 50-50 chance times its whole calculation. Then the mediums times its whole calculation times the twos or the, the longs times its whole calculation. And what you will eventually get to is that the entropy for length, again, just remember uh, if I, the conditional entropy of guessing liked, knowing the length, 0 0.36. Okay, fine. Then guess what? Okay, I, I just, you do it again. Notice I just sit down, I work through the calculations one more time, and you'll notice, ah, there's going to be a slight pain point soon. I, I, I say pain point, but not really, because right? you're going to notice. I'm kind of just rounding up with genre, right? I kind of, you know, have the same value going on here. Ties can happen. That's annoying. But does that mean, or am I, are my, what am I framing this? Just because you have a tie, did that tell me my best attribute? Shaking your head, no, why? The length one was already smaller. Ah, the length one was already smaller, so I have more information gain. Remember, this is conditional entropy, uncertainty, or sorry, this is entropy, uncertainty of guessing the correct answer. This is conditional entropy, uncertain of guessing the correct answer based on the fact that I know some value of it. That's all that means, is just how uncertain are you now that you know something? about this record. How certain are you based on knowing the directory? It's still not that certain. But length seemed pretty straightforward, right? If you're a medium movie, or where's my mediums, right? If you're a medium movie, I liked you. I mean, this handsome devil liked you. If you were a long movie, they didn't. If it was short, it's still a toss-up, right? but it's a pretty easy toss-up. Like, it's a very lopsided four-fifths over one-fifth, or against one-fifth. So again, as you're looking for these calculations, again, the game becomes, which is my first split? And in that case, again, I calculated out the probability of my, my yeses. I calculated out the entropy based on just a random guess. I calculated the entropies based on each one of the attributes and knowing them. And so now I'm doing what's the information gain of learning each individual attribute. This is now where we get that idea of best criteria. Best criteria is which one of these gives me the largest information gain. And so you look at all your attributes and you're essentially just picking the max of this. What do you do in a tie? Pick one. I mean, you know, that's not the best answer, but pick one, right? And so, again, that's, that's the whole kit and caboodle. So what do you do next? Well, again, if you think about this is getting back to it, I can have multiple branches in a decision tree. There's nothing saying it needs to be a binary one. Uh, and technically speaking, you all sat down through your A, B, 
trees, your red black trees. You could convert this into a binary tree. <laughs> I know how to do it. You, you, know, you sit down. <laughs> My point being, right? Oh, okay. Well, again, oh, mediums, yes. It's longs, no. But shorts are uncertain. So what do I do? Well, I am going to filter, right? I'm going to only look at now my short movies. And I'm going to ask the same question over again, right? Which attribute was the best one to pick from? OK, right? You notice it's a much smaller case in point. Maybe I have an option that would make it easier. Is it uh, that I, if I know the genre, does that help? Well, not quite. If I know the director, does that help, right? You know, both of them can kind of work. But the reason why I leave it as the way it is is because, OK, you sit down. You work through the calculation. Notice something eerily ugly about this. You hit the same entropy on both your attributes, which means you're going to hit the same information gain on, ooh, excuse me, both your attributes. So what do you do? So you just pick one? You can just pick one. This is where, you know, uh, pick a random one, pick the, the first one. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes. I, so this, I, yes, it, 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 I'll, I'm going to jump ahead in my slides for a second. It's gone. <clears throat> that forms something where you, the next stage of sort of a decision tree is building out what we then call a random forest. So the entire idea is maybe you don't, build the decision tree on the entire data set at once, you cut it down, or you filter it in some way, or you get rid of some of the attributes, right? You're, you're just kind of trying to do one instance of a decision tree. Then what do you do? Well, then on a completely different version or view of that same data set, you make another decision tree, and another one, and another one, and another one, and you make X number of decision trees, creating something known as a forest, you see, tree, four, right? Oh, <laughs> the light bulb went off there, right? Yes, again, so why? Because, well, what you can do, right, when that happens is then you take a vote. All of your trees that you have, well, again, they are built on the data set. They have been built on their interpretation of the best attribute based on its subsample. And then, well, okay, just based on all of your trees, what was the vote? Like, who, who won? And so, again, that becomes your, your answer to them. Mm -hmm. Where were we? So we were right about here questions on the decision tree? Yes? So def1 is always going to be one attribute. Def2 can have different attributes selected for like, so say for mediums, it was, it shows genre, but for long it shows director. Like that can happen at the same depth. They can use different attributes to split. So you're picking one attribute. So you still just pick one, but the idea is that then you would make maybe another decision tree that has the other attribute instead. Even on different like, branches of the tree. So like under medium, it chooses genre to split the data, and then under long, it chooses higher. That is an approach. So yes and no. Uh, so specifically, it's... Um, as you're kind of pruning, right? So ID3 specifically, if you kind of looked at it, it's not getting rid of an attribute, right? There's nothing in the algorithm specifically that was saying, hmm, where are we? There's nothing specifically in the algorithm that is saying remove an attribute from consideration. One attribute becomes potentially not worthwhile anymore 
because if everything's the same value, it, it doesn't give me any new information. Um, but, you know, in theory, you could have it dropped or you could keep, you know, I could keep genre uh, even though I'm using it as a filter. You know, again, if you go all the way back here, like pedal width is being used multiple times in the C, you know, the C24 version of the algorithm. So you don't immediately get rid of it, but with at least the discrete version, uh, you know, ID3's version, it doesn't help anymore. Hopefully that answered. Where are we? So we got that calculation. So again, this is that idea of maybe we picked genre uh, as our sort of next node. Again, it's remember when you're dealing with a tree-like structure, a tree is just a collection of sub-trees inside it. So this is just treating, you know, this genre is just treating itself like it's its own root. Right? It doesn't really care about the parents and whatnot. And so again, that same thing can happen. And you notice suddenly I have built out a decision tree. The first thing we should evaluate is the length of a movie. If it is medium, we'll just go ahead and say yes, or we'll make the guess of yes. If it's long, we'll say no. If it's short, right, then we have to dig a little deeper. Well, what was the genre of those uh, movies? Now, you notice I don't have any actions in this case. What do I do here, right? That becomes a big issue as well. And yes, I, 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 again, those types of things are open questions, right? What do you do there, right? Because you don't have an answer. So do you return false, no, yes, unknown, right? Or do you guess based on what you have left over at that point, right? Because I don't know and I don't see one for it yet, right? So this actually gets into some of the limitations of the decision tree. When you start dealing with machine learning's side of things, one of the big things that you have to deal with is the fact that, oh, all of these are algorithms that someone's already built in a library somewhere. Specifically, notice what we talked about on Monday, right? Before I even delve, look at me using delve. Before I even, thank you, right? Before I even got into the different algorithms, I was already telling you about how do we evaluate the different models against each other. Because what's the point, right? Well, what you're doing oftentimes is you're gonna take that decision tree and you may compare it against another classifier. Or you take a single decision tree and compare it to a random forest. Or you take my ID3 version and you compare it to the C24 version, right? You're gonna be doing, again, this is, since it's all built out and implemented for us out there, right? The whole point is now, oh, let me test all the models and find out which one performed the best. So the issue with that, why I mean that is now we hit what happens when you see a decision tree was the best performing one. And this is, again, why we talked about the random forest already. The issue with it is, one, what happens if I have tons of attributes, right? So I'm trying to find a good example of this. Well, I'll just, what if you have a, a data set that has just uh, 200 attributes, but most of them don't change? Right? Well, that means this whole algorithmic process, because you happen to have just like more of these, you have to do more calculations. And what happens if they accidentally did give you more information gain, right? But they weren't useful in any way when it comes to explainable AI, being able to determine something. I remember, um, did anyone, has anyone ever gotten to play Crystal Island? here at NC State. No? Okay. Well, right, I got plenty of time, so I'm going to deviate Crystal Island NCSU. So Crystal Island is, all right, come on. Just, that works, fine, fine. 
Crystal Island. It is a game that we used and built here. Uh, James Lester in his lab, uh, the Center of Educational Informatics. Uh, again, they have a, a, a game out there that is helping teach uh, K through 12 uh, students biology specifically with the scientific method. Uh, oh, there's a disease that is going on uh, on this island. It is now your job to find out what's causing the illness or the, the thing. Well, again, all right, okay, fine. There's a lot of metrics that get collected as the students are playing the game. Why I present this is, again, I took that data set Right? Because again, we were, you know, as grad students, that's what we, we, we did that, right? And specifically, I threw it into a decision tree. And you know what the best way of determining whether or not the student was successful at guessing, you know, the correct, you know, thing that was causing the illness on the island? Very simple process. Did they? Do the tutorial. Oh, right. Because they, again, what ha you know, it specifically is literally like, do you just immediately start running off the dock? Uh, or do you go to the thing that is like, go to the magnifying glass to learn how to solve the problem? And that was the deciding factor, right? That's, but the problem is that's not really good explaining, right? Because that's not what we're studying. We're not studying did they play the game or not. We're trying to study if our specific kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, our specific kind of experiment is improving learning or not. So that can be major issues. Again, that same kind of thing. What if there's just tons of, right, did they do the tutorial or not? That's not really helping answer or give us something that helps explain these decisions, right? Yes, it does, but not, right, again, it's not useful to you beyond pointing and laughing at they didn't do the tutorial, right? The other little problem is uh, that you may just be stuck with everything being a tie at some point, right? Um, and then finally, the bigger major issue, if you ever see decision tree as the top performer, is here is the weakness. Here's what is poor about it. It has the problem of overfitting. What is overfitting? Uh, fitting the result too much to the data set you have rather than what data set might be in practice. Yes. When you overfit, effectively, you are super hyper-tuning your model so that it only works on your data set, right? It is hyperfixed. It, it is overfit. Uh, so again, uh, the big issue there is what happens when you try and transfer your model, right? Now, okay, I trained it on my model. Now let's put it out there in the wild, right? Does my model, does my decision tree about movies reflect everyone, right? Maybe, maybe not. We don't, again, that's the, the big issue. It's specially tuned for me. I mean, for me, right? But not for everyone, right? Uh, so how do we resolve that, right? That's where that random forest that I kind of already jumped ahead to is talking about. Like, how can I fix the fact that one decision tree may overfit? Okay, well, the problems I can do is maybe I make a depth. Right? I'm only allowed to go a certain level down. Right? I don't, I, you know, after five levels, I don't care however much is left, then we're just doing a random selection. I don't dig all the way deep because, again, what happens if I'm dealing with uh, 200 attributes? I don't want a 200 depth tree. Right? That's just too deep. So I can mitigate that by saying, oh, we'll have some cutoff point. Uh, and then we'll work off of some uh, label, or we can start getting rid of some of those attributes that we, again, this is the data pre-processing phase. Let's start pruning the attributes that we collected but are not worthwhile, right? Because they're, again, they don't help at all. They're not really meant to be answering our question. If a student, you know, visited the tutorial or not, right? That's not helpful for like the actual experiment, right? Um, 
So this is where it's a little bit of working together and I'll also release this as a, a full-on work through. But I'm going to give you 10 minutes. So we'll come back at 4.10. Uh, start working on risk for credit card evaluations or loan applications. We'll be back in 10. And we are back. So let me see if anyone was able to tackle it all at once. Did anyone get through it all? Where are we? Decision tree. Ha, pa, pa. Oh, all right. We got a few responses. Cool. Uh, let's see what we got here. One, one. Okay. All right. All right. I know that this is going to be in a little thing. Okay. So you're all getting it. That's, that's good for me to see. The calculations are slightly off. Um, or not off, but like, you know. Google does its weird thing. Uh, but no, so far, again, if you did not, I get you. I understand. What I will say is that I have a full walkthrough of it uh, that will be unlocked in just a few minutes, so in four minutes' time. Uh, it walks through the whole breakdown so you can see what the final solution would look like, specifically then as you're looking at those root nodes. So specifically, you can see I'm doing a lot of those calculations as well. I break it down for you. You can see, you know, I'll give you a hint. This is eerily similar to how I'm going to be evaluating it for a final. I know, because it's the downward slope, isn't it? We're at the end tail, right? So no, but again, you can see that those calculations are coming in. Then what happens when you start to break it down? Um, so again, I've worked through it, so hopefully that can help you out a little bit as well. Um, but just because I want to keep moving again, so what we get at the end is, okay, what you're doing with this as like it's a good starting point. Typically, then what you would do is you would use something like a random forest because, again, what we had as limitations uh, to the decision tree is, again, overfitting, right? It can be too tuned for one version. So what we would end up doing is we go and let's create a bunch of them on slightly, you know, trimmed or randomly sampled or whatever, you know, parts of the data set. Again, what you're just essentially trying to build is now, instead of just one decision tree that may be overfit, let's build a bunch of them. That way, if there are overfitted uh, trees, they would get drowned out by, uh, like, if this one was overfit to that A, right? Again, now we have something that's going to at least allow us to kind of now have a consensus among our different trees. Questions? All righty. Well, in that case, everybody, I'll see you all next week. Try and get a little sleep. And... Take care.